Father Rampe, unfortunately, is traveling this, e this evening. He was hoping to be at his destination already, but didn't calculate it uh, as accurately as he thought, and it's further than he thought. So um, on behalf of, of the Social Apostolates for the Southern African Province of the Society of Jesus and the Jesuit Institute, welcome to this evening's talk. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Father Grant Tange, um, who's a Jesuit uh, recently, um, sorry, I'm admitting people as I'm talking, um, <laughs> recently appointed as the director of the Jesuit Institute in South Africa. So Father Grant uh, studied law at UCT, uh, and after that did two years of articles at a big law firm in Johannesburg. Um, it was during this time that he was discerning his vocation, and soon after that he joined the Society of Jesus. He did his novitiate and his philosophy, I think, in um, the UK, and then came back to South Africa, did a master's in human rights law, uh, and then went to study theology in France. Um, he was ordained just after COVID, um, so very recently, and after his ordination, he was sent to the Jesuit Center for Theological Reflection at uh, um, in Lusaka in Zambia, uh, where he was for about two and a half years before he joined us at the Institute. So we look forward to your talk this evening, Grant. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Oshla, and good evening, everyone. It's uh, it's nice to be with you this evening, and uh, I uh, it's 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 great that we've had this series of lectures or webinars at least on the se during the season of creation, and this brings our series to this webinar is the final one in the series. And tonight I'm going to be uh, talking about the spirituality of ecology, or perhaps more specifically the spirituality that can be found in Laudato Si and also uh, with, with a lens of Ignatian spirituality as well. So just with, uh, with that in mind, maybe I, uh, Ashley, you can share the uh, PowerPoint that, that we have. So the spirituality of ecology, and of course the, the hope of this season of creation 2024 is to hope and act with creation. So firstly, we have to outline the spiritual problem. If we're gonna talk about the spirituality of ecology, uh, uh, we have to somehow fit all this into um, our uh, uh, a problem. A spirituality uh, obviously has to respond to a problem. And there's this wonderful quote from Father Thomas Berry, who was a Catholic priest from North Carolina, uh, who was an environmental uh, activist. We are talking only to ourselves. We are not talking to the rivers. We are not listening to the wind and the stars. We have broken the great conversation. By breaking that conversation, we have shattered the universe. All the disasters that are happening now are a consequence of that spiritual, what he calls spiritual autism. So this quotation is interesting. So the consequence of a spiritual autism is that we don't see nature really as it is. We only see ourselves in relation to what we need from nature. So maybe if we can say, our readings of Genesis up to Laudato Si, which is Pope Francis's groundbreaking 2016 uh, encyclical on the environment, was that nature was a gift from God that we were masters of. We could use nature how we wanted. We only saw nature through a lens of our needs and desires for what nature could provide us. So the result is that we, are, we stopped seeing nature for what it is in itself. We didn't think that God has any desire for nature apart from giving it to us to help us to flourish. So up to now, it has been a completely, or at least up to let out to see, it had been a completely utilitarian approach to nature, only evaluating the value of nature in terms of what it could be used for, not seeing the value of nature as being inherent. And this is a spiritual problem. We are not seeing, seeking or seeing God's desire for nature in itself and his desires for our use of nature. We're not seeing the negative impacts of our relationship with the planet and the poor, who are the worst victims of our spiritual sickness. And Pope Francis says as much in the first two paragraphs of Laudato Si. He says that our sister Earth is crying out because of the harm that we have inflicted by our irresponsible use and abuse of the Earth. He says that we have come to see ourselves as sister Earth's lords and masters, plundering her at will. 
He notes that the violence present in our hearts wounded by sin is reflected in the negative impact we are having in the very soil we walk on, in the water we drink, in the air we breathe. Pope Francis describes the earth as one of the most abandoned, maltreated of our poor. So this spiritual evaluation of our problem is shared by other faiths as well, not just Christianity. So the uh, quotation that we see up on your screens at the moment is a quotation from the Vietnamese Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, we noted the following about our way of life. We have created a society in which the rich become richer and the poor become poorer, in which we are so caught up in our immediate problems that we cannot afford to be aware of what's going on with the rest of the human family or our planet Earth. In my mind, I see a group of chickens in a cage disputing over a few seeds of grain, unaware that in a few hours they will all be killed. Let me repeat that last sentence there. In my mind, says Thich Nhat Hanh, I see a group of chickens in a cage disputing over a few seeds of grain, unaware that in a few hours they will all be killed. That really brings it you know, home to us very powerfully. So from afar, we must look quite petty fighting over our resources on the planet, all the while not knowing that the earth is struggling and that our very lives are at risk. For Thich Nhat Hanh, it's precisely the lack of mindfulness of our situation that will ultimately be the death of us. So this lack of mindfulness or prison that Father Berry wrote about is tackled directly by Laudato Si. It provides a spiritual assessment of our situation and also identifies a solution to our spiritual sickness. What we can look at in our presentation tonight, perhaps, is what Laudato Si says from a spiritual point of view. We can identify a spirituality of ecology in it, but we can also look at the document through the lens of specifically an Ignatian worldview. What would St. Ignatius say about Laudato Si? So Ignatius had a great admiration for nature. In Loyola in Spain, where he grew up, it's very beautiful, with mountains surrounding his family home. In the first chapter of his autobiography, Ignatius outlines that the greatest consolation he used to receive at Loyola just after his conversion experience was to look up at the sky and at the stars, which he did often for a long time, because in his words, he used to feel in himself a great impetus towards serving our Lord. So this sounds very familiar to the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, who looked at creation and his heart was lifted as he wanted to praise God. The first line of Laudato Si recognizes this as it says, Laudato Si, mi Senor, praise be to you, my Lord, which echoes the sentiments of St. Francis of Assisi in his brilliant poem, The Canticle of the Creatures, when he sees creation. So now we, we have a, a theme of awe in front of creation as a strong theme running throughout the entire encyclical of Laudato Si. So it starts with, this theme of praise, let thou to see, praise be to you, Lord, and ends with it. And it is very beautiful. And there's a strong call in the document to praise and to worship God in his creation. So it is a very strong, it's very strong, this call in chapter two of let thou to see, where he speaks about the church's teaching on creation. He speaks of, air, of each creature having its own purpose in creation. So the soil, the water, the mountains, everything is what he calls a caress of God. Pope Francis observed that there are places of spiritual significance for all of us in nature, and that our friendship with God is linked to these places. So obviously you can think of maybe some sacred spaces on earth that maybe you like to, to travel to, that maybe where the mists between, or the veil between earth and the sacred is very thin. So maybe Pope Francis is used to spending time outdoors, but we can certainly hear an invitation here to renew ourselves by going back to these places, to recover something of our true selves. Pope Francis speaks of the book that God has written, the book of nature, and that nature is a constant source of awe and wonder. 
So he, he quotes the Catholic Bishops Conference in Japan to sense each creature singing the hymn of its existence is to live joyfully in God's love and hope. With these words, you can almost imagine St. Ignatius sitting in his room at Loyola, staring up at the stars and praising God. The Pope says that we can see God reflected in all that exists and our hearts are moved to praise him, to worship God in union with his creatures. I think the principle of hope that Pope Francis has when he tries to get us or anyone to read Laudato Si is to be caught up in this awe and wonder at the universe because this experience has a lot to teach us about the way we interact with nature. So chapter two of Laudato Si is called the gospel of creation. And Francis is adamant that nature has a message for us if we are willing to look at it and to listen with all our hearts. Seeing the harmony and the balance in the world around us, we can learn how to live in harmony, not only with one another, but with the earth and with the environment. And this comes out strongly in the final chapter, chapter six of Laudato Si, where he advocates trying to see beauty again around us, to get caught up like Ignatius in nature and being led by that to serve God and to serve one another. Because it is Francis's intuition that if we see something as beautiful, we will not abuse it or treat it just as an object for our gratification. Therefore, when we consider St. Ignatius and his moments of consolation when he looks up at the sky, we're seeing a key spiritual insight for all of us. Perhaps for the first time, he's actually seeing nature as a work of God and is moved to praise the Lord for it in a position of awe. And that perhaps this is a starting point to get us out of our spiritual autism and a lack of mindfulness of nature. And of course, in this spirituality of ecology, it's also a grace that we can pray for. The grace of seeing nature, not through the lens of what it can do for us, but as a revelation of the divine work that God has put into the world around us. So at the beginning of the spiritual exercises, Ignatius places the meditation, which is meant to prepare one for their journey into the exercises. And it is Ignatius' discussion of the purpose of life and God's vision for us and our journey on earth. In it, Ignatius discusses why we are created and suggests that we are created to praise, to reverence, and to serve God our Lord, and by doing this to save our souls. He then goes on to say that everything on earth is a gift from God, and we are to use these gifts in a way that praises, reverences, and serves him, which is our purpose in life. So this is called the principle and foundation. So you can see that the principle and foundation, the photo picture here is a plant with roots, and I suppose the principle and foundation is the rootedness of our, uh, our spirituality uh, that, that uh, provides a foundation for all that goes forth. Everything, according to the principle and foundation, is gifts in a way that praises, reverences, and serves him, which is the purpose of our life. So this understanding of the purpose of our life is also reflected in La Dato Si. Pope Francis has a vision for the earth and our relationship to it, which he uh, identifies as God's vision. In chapter two, he situates creation in the context of Catholics' teaching on, in, in scripture and discusses how we are meant to see creation. Again, this call to see nature through a different lens comes out. So like Ignatius, Pope Francis has an answer to the question of what life's about, where we are headed and what this is for anyway. And he specifically says that unless we deal with the deeper issues of life, the meaning of life, its general direction, where it is heading to, he doesn't believe that our approach to the environment will change. So in paragraph 160, he poses these questions to us. What is the purpose of our life in this world? Why are we here? What is the goal of all our efforts? What need does the world have of us? Isn't that an interesting question? What kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us, to the children who are now growing up? So what does he say to us as answers to this question? And the vision of the world that he shares with us is found at the end of chapter two. He says that the ultimate destiny of the universe is in the fullness of God, 
which has already been obtained by the risen Christ, the, who is the measure of the maturity of all things. It's a very rich sentence. So we can get this image of the whole universe moving towards God, finding its resting place in God at the end of time. And this is very similar to Ignatius, who says that we are created to praise, to reverence, to serve God, and by this means to save our souls. There's a, there's a contemporary translation of the principle and foundation by David Fleming. And he says that we are created to love God, to serve him in this life, and by this means to be happy with God forever. Their existence blesses God and gives him glory. This is so important. This is really a revolution. So other creatures have their own purpose too in God, and we are to respect that. And we are to use the things on the earth, not only in accordance with the purpose for which God made us, but also we are to use them in accordance with the purpose for which God made these other creatures. And other creatures have a value in themselves. They're not just there for our own purposes, but they have an innate value. So how, are we, how are, are we to use the earth? Pope Francis in chapter 2 speaks of the need for each community to take from the bounty of the earth whatever it needs for its subsistence. But every community also has a duty to protect the earth and to ensure its fullness for coming generations. He also speaks of tilling and keeping the earth. So tilling is cultivating and keeping is caring of the earth. And ultimately, human beings have to respect the particular goodness of every creature, and to avoid the disordered use of things. So this is an interesting word here, disordered, and it uh, has a link with, of course, Ignatian spirituality. What is he, how does he mean that in terms of Laudatus C? He speaks of the laws of nature and the delicate equilibria that exist between the creatures of this world. We have to live in harmony, not only with one another as human beings, but with the world and all of its creatures. There's a rhythm in the world and we have to respect it. And he says, when we sin, we break this rhythm. The relationships with one another are damaged, but also with the earth and other creatures. He speaks about everything being connected and interconnected. And his encyclical ends on a crescendo looking at the Trinity. He says the Trinity is about relationship. We are called out of ourselves and into relationship, into communion with God, with one another, and with the planet, a truly global solidarity. So one very important thing to mention about this disordered use of things, not only can we use and abuse things for ourselves and damage the environment in the process, he also says that there is a universal destination of goods. And this ties in with Catholic social teaching. And it has some quite contentious uh, conclusions. He says that the church has nothing against private property, but he mentions that private property is not absolute. He says that God gave the earth to the whole human race, the, the sustenance of all its members, without excluding or favoring anyone. So he is thinking here about the poor and the underprivileged. And there is a dramatic inequality in the world where the rich enjoy the best fruits of the earth, and the poor get nothing. He sees this in the context of the purpose of creation as a disordered use of things. And then Pope Francis speaks also of, and you would, you would know that from other, other talks that he's given, of a throwaway culture. We use and we throw away. And this generates so much waste because of our disordered desire to consume more than what is really necessary. So what St. Ignatius and Pope Francis can teach us with what they're saying here is quite important. We have to consider the purpose of our lives as to praise, reverence, and serve the Lord. When we are considering how to use the resources of the, of, of the earth to praise, reverence, and serve him, we have to take into account that everything on the earth is inherently valuable. And this should have an impact on how we use the planet's resources. Once again, there is a call to see nature through a lens which considers more than just how nature is useful to us. So nature is beautiful in its own right. Now use of nature has to be more respectful because of that. And when we use nature selfishly or in a disordered way, we enter into the world of sinful behavior. 
So now we can look a little bit at sinfulness. In the exercises, Ignatius has us look at our sinfulness. So there are some very powerful meditations which, which are designed in exercises to help us to look around and to see the world in its sinfulness. And then to help us to see how, uh, our contribution to that sinfulness, our own part in the chaos and confusion we find ourselves in. And these meditations are meant to make us grapple with the senselessness of it and our inability to save ourselves. Why do we do what we do in our disordered way? And of course, we do these meditations with God, acknowledging him as our savior. And one exercise is particularly striking. And David Fleming, again, has a contemporary translation of the text. He says, I reflect that out of me, one human person among the millions of people who live, so much evil, hatred, and death can come forth. What can I compare myself to? A sewer polluting the waters of the river of life. So this image of so much good coming to me, but so much pollution coming out from me. Not an easy meditation to make. You have this image of God sending all this goodness towards us, and what comes out is not necessarily as good. So when reading through Laudato Si, you can see many parallels between this image in the exercises and what Pope Francis is saying we are doing to the earth. Laudato Si is not a comfortable read in many ways. It, is a lit it mentions at least a litany of sins against our planet that we are engaging in. One intense image is one which Pope Francis uses in chapter 3 of Laudato Si. It's the image of what he calls the technological paradigm maybe a paradigm, a way of seeing things. Pope Francis is not against technology, but he is against sometimes the way we are using it. But it is frightening about how he speaks of it. We are not using technology so much as technology is using us, and we are drawn in, despite of ourselves, into this technological paradigm. So Pope Francis says technological products are not neutral. They end up conditioning our lifestyles, shaping social possibilities, on the long lines uh, dictated by the interest of certain power groups. We're not merely using technology as a useful instrument. We rely almost absolutely on technology, and would, it would be difficult to do without it. I don't know, It's uh, just thinking here, it, there was that one time when Facebook was out of action for like 24 hours, and I think Instagram, the WhatsApp as well, there was a little bit of a panic across the world, like when is Facebook coming back? When is WhatsApp? That gives you an indication of the truth of what he's talking about. The focus of our lives has become ourselves and whatever is most useful and expedient to us, regardless of what impact this is having on others and on the earth. We lay our hands on things, attempting to extract everything that we can from this planet. But the scary thing about what Francis is saying about this is that we are immersed in a system that is bigger than ourselves. It's hard to stop this system. Each one of us values technology and relies on our technology to make our lives easier. But because of that, technology is profitable. The economy and the free market make sure that we get what we want, regardless of what this means for others and for the planet. And I suppose if we think maybe, what, what good can I do? If I stopped using technology, would it stop the system? Would, would other people stop buying technology? Maybe not. So we are immersed in this system. Pope Francis says that this dynamic results in this idea that the planet has an endless supply of whatever we want and need, and that the planet is being squeezed, dry, beyond every limit. We wrongly think that the negative impacts of this can be easily absorbed by the planet. He says that hidden underneath all this dynamic is not even the motive or profit of the well-being of people, but where, what really drives this is power, a desire for lordship over all. So what is scary about what he is saying? 
Like the exercises and the meditations and the sinfulness, we get the impression that we are immersed in something we cannot get ourselves out of without help. In other words, we need a savior. Pope Francis' words, we fail to see the deepest roots of our present failures, which have to do with the direction, goals, meaning, and social implications of technology and economic growth. The meditation on of St. Ignatius on sinfulness is meant to help us to see how stuck we are and how much we need that salvation that comes from Jesus. This is the meditations on sinfulness in the exercises. We are called in these exercises to stand at the foot of the cross and to speak to Jesus as a friend speaks to a friend, to fully realize how much God has done for us in Christ and it is in this place of standing before the cross that we realize how much we need God. And we want to live in praise of him who has saved us from a spiritual blindness. And it's because of this that we can speak about the call to conversion and to speak about salvation. So Pope Francis in Adato Si calls us to conversion. Very practically, he calls us to profound changes in lifestyles, modes of production and consumption, and the established structures of power which today govern societies. Ultimately, the picture of God that comes out in the encyclical is very much like Ignatius' own vision of God. And it is a beautiful, beautiful vision. A God who is in the world and who is with us, calling us to conversion. God is with us, helping us on our way. Pope Francis in chapter 2 has, of, of Laudato Si has a breathtaking view of the presence of God in the world. He says that God is intimately present to each being without impinging on the autonomy of his creature. Very beautiful image there. God is freely interacting with us, but he is present to all of us. Also, his divine presence, which ensures the, the subsistence and growth of each being, continues the work of creation. The Spirit of God has filled the universe with possibilities, and therefore, from the very heart of things, something new can always emerge. Nature is nothing other than a certain kind of art, namely God's art, impressed upon things, whereby the, those things are moved to a determinate end. And then he ends this quote with a magnificent image. It is as if a shipbuilder were able to give timbers the wherewithal to move themselves to take the form of a ship. Isn't that a beautiful image? That God has given us creativity. He's given us our gifts. He's given us our talents. He's given us intelligence. And we are participating in God's creation uh, as we live and use our creativity. There's a powerful image here of the image of the spirit in the world continuing the act of creation. And almost in spite of ourselves, in spite of our sinfulness, we are moving towards our end. This is reflected more, once more precisely in the part where he speaks about the technological paradigm that we mentioned earlier. He has such a beautiful image there of how the work of the Spirit can break through, even in the toughest challenges. So remember, Pope Francis says that we are called to conversion, to a right relationship between ourselves and God, between one another and a right relationship with creation. And one of the important ways he says we can do this is to rediscover a sense that the world is beautiful. And we discussed this with Ignatius and with the stars. So just after discussing the technological paradigm, he says this. When the desire to create and contemplate beauty manages to overcome reductionism through a kind of salvation which occurs in beauty and in those who behold it, an authentic humanity calling for a new synthesis seems to dwell in the midst of our technological culture almost unnoticed, like a mist seeping gently beneath a closed door. 
What a beautiful, beautiful quotation. So the technological paradigm, the system that we are caught in, that we're struggling to get out of, is like a closed door. We're closing it on God. We're closing it on creativity. We're closing it on life. And we, there's nothing we can do to help ourselves. And God is like that mist that tries to get to us again underneath the door like a mist coming to us. So this echoes strongly what St. Ignatius says at the end of the spiritual exercises in the contemplation to attain love. And there's that on your screens there. I will see, this is what he has us meditate on at the end of the exercises. I will see how God dwells in creatures, in the elements giving being, in the plants giving growth, in the animals giving sensation, and in humankind granting the gift of understanding and so how he dwells also in me, giving me being, giving me life and sensation, and causing me to understand, to see too how he makes a temple of me as I've been created in the likeness and the image of his divine majesty. Very, very, very beautiful. He has us contemplate how God is with us and in everything, working towards our good, it is a call to look at nature, to see it differently through a different spiritual lens. So Pope Francis emphasizes the presence of God in nature and in us, specifically mentioning Christ, our Savior. At the end of chapter 2 in the to see, Christ is central to Pope Francis' images of God in the world. He says that all creation is bound up with the mystery of Christ, present from the beginning. And the word became flesh. Christ entered the cosmos, throwing his lot with it, even to the cross. From the beginning of the world, but particularly through the incarnation, the mystery of Christ is at work in a hidden manner in the natural world as a whole, without thereby impinging on his autonomy. We see here a text that emphasizes Christ is at work in the world, helping it to achieve its purpose. And this echoes of uh, what St. Ignatius says of Christ in the call of the king in the spiritual exercises. So St. Ignatius has this wonderful meditation on Christ as a powerful leader or king who is himself at work in the world. Ignatius asks us to consider our vocations, our calling in the light of the call of Christ. Christ who invites us to work with him in helping the world to achieve its purpose. So the call to work with Christ the King so that the earth can achieve its purpose is also reflected in Laudato Si. In chapter 2, Pope Francis says that Jesus in his earthly life was in harmony with creation and also worked as a craftsman. So in this, he sanctified human labor and endowed labor with a special significance for us. And here he quotes St. John Paul II when he says, By enduring the toil of work in union with Christ crucified for us, Human beings, in a way, collaborate with the Son of God for the redemption of humanity. So we get this beautiful idea of God being in the world from the beginning. Christ having entered into the world in the incarnation, working for our salvation. And we are called to work with him towards wholeness and our ultimate end in God. So this cooperation with God as he works in the world is all over the encyclical of Laudato Si. In chapter 2, Pope Francis says that God, who wishes to work with us and who counts on our cooperation, can bring good out of the evil that we have done. In chapter 3, he mentions this again, when he mentions that the role of human beings is to cooperate with the work of God in creation. But of course, in a special way, Pope Francis includes the salvation of all creation in his vision of the world. So Christ is not only drawing us to the Father, he is drawing every creature towards its ultimate end in God. The Son will deliver all things to the Father. So as our last reflection, maybe we can think of what we have discussed tonight and think of how it's 
has become perhaps a spirituality of healing. If we answer the call of Christ and the call to conversion, we will be led to see the world with different eyes. So this call is in both St. Ignatius' spirituality as well in Pope, as in Pope Francis' is led to see. The world is created by God and we can look at it with wonder. Every created thing has inherent value. The way we are living is disordered according to the ultimate purpose of our lives and of each living thing. We have sinned and we, have, we are stuck in that sin. But God is present and God's grace in Christ abounds. We are called to work with that grace to bring about healing. What will that healing be look like? What will that healing look like? What would the world look like if our conversion process is complete? It would be a healing of relationships between ourselves and between God, and also between one another as human beings, and the relationship we have with creation. And importantly, a world marked by justice. And this is something that's very interesting in the Tao see. Pope Francis sees justice as including right relationships with one another, right relationships with the world. And he said that these notions of justice are inseparable. So all throughout the encyclical, he mentions the poor, the elderly, the vulnerable, as being the most impacted by the damage to the environment. And so the way we are treating the world is negatively impacting our most needy brothers and sisters. And he says that all of us, no matter who we are, have the right to life, happiness, and dignity. And living in a polluted and damaged world is not a dignified life. He has the sense that everything is connected. We are connected to one another, and we are connected in an intimate way to, with the world. So he says that concern for the environment thus leads, needs to be joined to a sincere love for our human beings, fellow human beings, and an unwavering commitment to resolving the problems of our society. And he says this in a powerful way in chapter three. Our relationship with the environment can never be isolated from our relationship with others and with God. Otherwise, it would be nothing more than romantic individualism dressed up in ecological garb, locking us into a strifling imminence. Isn't that an interesting phrase? So ultimately, our salvation is about healing of relationships. If we get rid of spiritual autism and unmindfulness, we will be welcomed into a new relationship with one another and with the planet. So to emphasize this, the Dr. C ends very powerfully by speaking of the Trinity and how St. Bonaventure saw that each creature bears in itself a specifically Trinitarian structure, a Trinitarian structure that is so real that it could be readily contemplated if only the human gaze were not so partial, dark, and fragile. That's very beautiful as well. The divine persons in the Trinity are in relationship. The Trinity is about relationship, and the world is created with a stamp of the Trinity on it. And Pope Francis invites us to see the complex web of relationships which exist in the world. And he says that the human person grows more, matures more, and is sanctified more to the extent that he or she enters into relationships going out from us, from ourselves to live in communion with God, with others, and with all creatures. So here we see an invitation that we can all respond to, to see the world differently, to see the world as beautiful, to see the world that has all these wonderful webs of relationships in it. And that conversion will bring about an immense healing uh, of uh, our planet. So I'm at 7.45. I think I'm just going to stop there and invite your comments, responses, or questions. Thank you. I think uh, I've got lost my video now. Thank you very much, Grant, um, for that. Sorry, I've had technical issues on my end, so I apologize for all the <laughs> in and outing of your slideshow. Um, That's okay. We normally encourage people to put your questions or comments in the chat. So if you if you could do that, and then um, I'll share them with Grant, and we can we can see if if there's any anybody would like to ask something. 
Um, one of the, the comments that I have um, is a term that I came across uh, recently uh, that was coined by Raymond Panicker, I think, the term cosmotheandric. And I just love it because it's um, it's that idea that of the cosmos, the cosmo, the thea, God, and the andric, the people, and how we're all one. And so that I think what you're saying is is really on those lines. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful phrase, isn't it? Cosmotheandric. <laughs> try, try and fit that into a sentence in the next week in your conversations. <laughs> I, I dare you. <laughs> Uh, let's have a look if there's anything in the chat. Peter says, thank you very much, Grant. Um, you've given us a very Ignatian reading of the spirituality of Laudato Lado Si. Do you trace any Franciscan inspiration in the encyclical? Wow. Thanks very much, Peter, for that lovely question. Uh, of course, you know, I think uh, perhaps the... Uh, the, the 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 first phrase, the first line of Laudato Si is, you know, praise be to God for for His creation, and I think that maybe that's what uh, Saint Francis of Assisi has to give us as a gift: this idea that he sees uh, um, a creation and praises God for it. Uh, and I think that there's a joy in Saint Francis of Assisi in in creation, and maybe that's what. That Dato C is really calling us to to have a joy in creation, to have that joy in the beauty of creation. I think it's a very, very Franciscan ideal, and and that would con combat our spiritual uh, autism or unmindfulness. Can anyone else uh, identify a Franciscan element? Any any hidden Franciscans among us? Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Father Grant um, and the Jesuit Institute. Delighted to see the connections you've made with the principal and foundation. Yeah, I, I think for me, the principal and foundation, when we're looking at it, uh, it, it has some challenges for us in, in our Ignatian spirituality because, as, as I said, there is the sense of Ignatius that we are to look at the whole world in a way, uh, we are asking that question, how can I use this, the nature around me to praise, reverence, and serve God for me? But then uh, Pope Francis maybe takes that insight a little bit further, and he has us ask, how can I use nature not to praise, reverence, and serve God as my goal, but also how to interact that with the, the goal of every, every creature? Every creature has its own goal, has its own use. And that's that adds something very interesting to that principle and foundation. So that that's it has that can send us back to think about that again. Are there any uh, reactions to Tichnot Han's image of chickens in a cage? Uh, Martin von Europe says there's a call to simplicity in Laudato Si, which is a Franciscan a charism. Simplicity result in less resources to less resources being used. Absolutely. I think that that's a, a, a very beautiful call in Laudato Si to maybe to come back to simplicity. We don't need half the things we use in this life. And and I, I, I mean, maybe that's a, a secular heresy to say that. Uh, but uh, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, how can we live it more simply uh, and uh, use less resources? Thank you, Martin. So no, so no responses to this chicken in the cage image. I, I when I read it, it was very strong for me. You know, uh, uh, it, it really has a such a powerful way to kind of uh, um, put our squ squabbles of resources into perspective. As we're scrobbling over the resources of the planet, we're, we're not really realizing how much the planet is suffering. And I think that's, that's a real call to an awareness, perhaps.
So Tao says, please add some more on the spirituality of healing. There's a great need for healing of our relationships between nations and nations and between humans and creation. Absolutely. I mean, we could all use a bit of spirituality of healing at the moment with the wars that are going on all around us. You know, relationships are being damaged and, uh, you know, it, it really is quite a, quite a challenging time in, in human history because of those, those challenges. A spirituality of healing, I think what the one thing I love about Pope Francis's ideas and Ladao to see is that no matter how dark and bleak the picture is that he paints of the planet and how suffer, how much suffering we are causing it and how stuck we are in our uh, um, in our way of using the planet, God is present in that wonderful way that will ultimately save us. Uh, we're, we're that wonderful image of the mist under under the door. Uh, we all we need to do in order to respond to the healing that God wants us to cooperate with is to look around us and to see the goodness around us, the the the, the people that are trying to heal our planet, the people that are trying to make uh, a, a point about uh, healing the planet. So there are there are. No, there are signs of God's presence and activity all around us. And all we need to do is tap into it to see how we can respond better to uh, what we are doing to the planet. So spirituality of healing, I suppose it has a lot to do with grace and to do with our response to that grace. It's not so bleak at the end. There is, there is hope and God uh, is leading us, I suppose, whether we like it or not, into healing. <laughs> which is a wonderful image. Have, it's, a, it's quite a long document, let to see. But what, what, I, what I like to, to look at is the poetic language that Pope Francis has in the Tao Si. He doesn't write a very academic text. He writes something that's quite accessible. And there are so many poetic uh, spaces in the text. If you want to go and reflect on, on, on this text for your own prayer, for your own spirituality, there's plenty to find in this text. Something I didn't mention that I particularly like is that uh, there is this tendency in our cities to put concrete everywhere, to just lay our foundations and to rip up the planet, rip up the grass, rip up the ground, and just put concrete everywhere. It's as if we are obsessed with providing our own beauty in the world. I mean, architecture is fine, but I, th I suppose one of, the, one of the challenges of modern architecture is, is to try and learn how best to use nature and architecture in a way that is both sustainable and beautiful so that's quite challenging to 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 um to to, uh, to architects i always think uh, what a missed opportunity cavendish square is in cape town you have this magnificent mountain behind you and you cannot see the mountain from the inside of the mall what a missed opportunity. You could be anywhere in South Africa when you're walking through that mall, but it, you're right there and the mountain's right there and you can't see it from inside. Couldn't we have thought of a little bit of uh, something else to use nature a little bit more appropriately? So Kay Hendrick writes, um, the idea of spiritual autism and the lack of mindfulness is very powerful. Replacing nature with concrete is again seeking for our convenience, absolutely. Uh, it is it is convenient walking on concrete, I suppose, but you know, there's something very beautiful about nature and, and we seem to be miss, missing out on it. And Tao said, the image of chickens in the cage calls us to reflect on how soon we will all go down together with creation if we don't take ecological conversion seriously. Yeah. So uh, we, we Perhaps we we are we can be accused of the of the sin of taking ourselves too seriously, uh, because you know 
that image of the chickens in the cage is, is just an idea of if we were to see ourselves as a little bit um, um, small-minded, taking ourselves too seriously, where if we were to expand our consciousness just a little bit more, we could we could actually see the bigger picture, which which uh, is quite which God wants us to see the that bigger picture. No thanks, thanks Tyler, thanks for that. So less concrete, more earth. There's I can remember. Lovely... Yeah, go on, go on. Sorry, there's that lovely image too of Saint Francis um, saying to leave a part of the garden to just grow wild, uh, rather than it's... trying to cultivate it, and and um, it's the same sort of idea. It, yeah, exactly. And and uh, uh, Francis of Assisi loved that. Um, that image of just letting nature do its thing. Um, just just out of interest, we, we're coming to the end now, of our, I suppose, of our, our time together, but just out of interest, fr from a legal perspective, it's actually hard to put a financial value on nature because in, in, in the law, sometimes the only way that you can prove the value of nature is through money. So the, how do you prove to the court that a company shouldn't shouldn't um, go and do something that it wants to do? Sometimes, in, I know in South African uh, uh, courts, you've got to prove that the financial damage to the company uh, that they will sustain when they stop the activity that they want to do to damage the environment is actually less than the financial damage to the environment. Uh, and then the court will stop it. How do you prove financial damage to the environment? How do you prove the the eradication of something that's irreplaceable? So one of the one of the solutions in the United States is to do a questionnaire. How much would you pay to go to the beach that's un that's un uh, und undamaged? How would how much would you pay a day to go to the beach? And that's one way. You get an average price of how much someone is willing to pay to use that creation. And that way you can actually put a financial cost on environmental damage. But putting a cost onto environmental damage, it's it's very difficult. So how can you say to a judge, just just protect it? It's so valuable. And the judge was like, Well, how much does it cost? How much would it cost? You can't, you can't prove it. The court is only concerned not about your sentiments and emotions, but about how much it's going to cost. And that's sometimes very hard. Mm. But it's so beautiful, Judge. Don't destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> Something interesting to think about. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Grant. I think that I mean, we've hit eight o'clock, and I think there was a really interesting talk, and you've given us a lot to think about. Um, yeah, and again, in our own minds, how much do we value the the world around us, the the ecology, the air we breathe, um, and what can we do about it as well? I think is quite important. Um, we thank everybody for joining us for this series. This is the last of our series. As I was saying earlier, the recordings are, are available. They're on the Jesuit Institute YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube, search for Jesuit Institute, um, you'll find them there. This one will hopefully be in, up in a day or two, um, but the others are already there. And um, thank you very much. We really appreciate you, you joining us. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.